Yeah, great. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Raphael, and I'm doing my PhD at the University of St Andrews in the UK. And I've been working on the... I'm not speaking in the mic, am I? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I've been working on the latest radial velocity data uh, of the Coro 7 planetary system. So this is what I'll be talking about. So, uh, so with radial velocity surveys, when we're looking down to uh, low mass planets like super Earths, uh, where the main source of noise that we're encountering is not from the instrument anymore. Uh, when we're using harps, it's due to the stellar activity of the star, uh, which produces uh, markers on the surface, and that induces a radial velocity component, which is of the same order of magnitude as uh, a super F uh, reflex motion. So um, this is the case in the Coro 7 system, which is quite an active star. And uh, I'll be telling you uh, the story about Coro 7 so far, and then I'll be explaining a bit uh, the physical sources of the radial velocity uh, due to the activity, so how it comes about. And uh, we've implemented a method called the FF prime method, <coughs> developed by Greitel in 2011. So I've implemented this in a code and then applied it to Coro 7 radial velocities and then I'll be telling you about the results. So Coro 7, uh, it was observed in the first run of the Coro satellite and it's a sun-like star, it's fairly bright and after a few weeks they picked up uh, very small transits and it turned out it was due to Coro 7b which at the time was uh, the smallest super F with a measured radius. So it was quite exciting, and uh, they then went on to do an intensive uh, radial velocity campaign of four months. And from these radial velocities, then Kiloit Al detected uh, another super F, Coro 7C, and also Hatzes et al. Uh, said there was a sub Neptune mass planet, uh, Coro 7D, but then uh, since then, there have been many analyses, many papers on the same data sets, uh, but they just couldn't agree on the masses of the planets and even the number of planets in the system. So this is why uh, we made new observations last year. Uh, and this time we have simultaneous photometry and uh, HARPS radial velocities. So yes, this, all these disagreements come because uh, the star is very active, and this is the light curve uh, of the 20, uh, 2009 run. And so this is over 120 days. And you can see, so the stellar period is about 23 days. And there it is every time. And so you've got an active region growing here. And you can see it grows more and then again more. And then in just one stellar rotation, it just disappears pretty much almost completely. And so the star is very active. And this is going to have a significant effect on the radial velocity. So uh, there's a picture of the sun. It's a high-resolution image from uh, the Solar Dynamics Ob Observatory. And you can see, so that's a stellar disk, and it's got sunspots here. So they're regions of high magnetic uh, fields, and they're blocking out the granulation. So here's a granulation pattern. That's a few thousand kilometers across each granule. And uh, so these two features uh, are going to cause two effects on the radial velocity. So the first one is due to the fact that the star rotates. So now imagine you have a star rotating and there are no spots on it, like this. So the half of the star that's coming towards you is emitting blue shifted light, and the other half that's going away is emitting slightly red shifted light. So you have a balance there. And this would be one of your spectral lines. So it's at a given wavelength and it's got this shape. But then now, if you have a spot that comes onto the surface, uh, this part, which is emitting slightly blue shifted light, uh, is emitting less light because of that dark and cool spot. So you're going to have a distortion in the line, and the line moves a little bit. And then as the spot moves across the stellar disk, uh, the distortion moves across the line. So these slight distortions uh, create an apparent radial velocity effect because the wavelength of the line changes. So that's the first effect. Uh, it can have an amplitude of a few meters per second. And the second effect is due to the granulation. So you've got a granulation pattern all over the disk of the star. 
And uh, so granules are basically big, bright cells of uh, fluid that's rising up because it's very hot. Uh, and then once it gets to the surface, it cools down and it falls back around these cells. So these are the, the black lines around them. And uh, the bright cells occupy a larger area overall. So you end up having a net blue shift over the whole disk. Uh, but then when you have active regions, uh, and in particular star spots, but you've also got uh, faculae and plages around them. So these active regions block the granulation and therefore they suppress the, the blue shift, so the convective blue shift due to the granulation. So this effect is thought to be the dominant one. So it's a few meters per second as well on moderately active stars like Coro 7. And uh, if we compare it to the radial velocity induced by a super Earth planet, so that one's going to have an amplitude of, well, maybe less than a meter per second or not much more than five meters per second. So this, the activity is really going to dominate the signal. So it's really important that we, might, we find ways to disentangle these two signals from each other to be able to calculate the masses of the planets. So here is the uh, Coro 7 in 2012. So this is the light curve, and it's taken at the same time as the radial velocity data. So these are simultaneous. And you can see so these variations. So the, the transits of Coro 7b have been removed, although we couldn't really see them, even if we hadn't, because they're really shallow. Um, so these variations are due to the spots and the active regions on the surface. They contain only information about the stellar activity. Whereas the radial velocity data, which has an amplitude of about 10, 15 meters per, sec per second, uh, they contain information about the stellar activity and the planets. So that's what we need. So we need to disentangle these two components. And to do this, uh, we've used uh, a method which makes use of the information about the activity in the light curve. So that's the FF prime method developed by a Granite Owl in 2011. And they, uh, they basically say that you can uh, model the radial velocity due to the activity uh, with two basis functions, one due to the uh, radial velocity due to the, the rotation of the stellar disk. So that's the first uh, method, I uh, the first cause I showed you. And then the second one is uh, the second basis function is represents the uh, suppression of convective blue shift. And you can scale these two with uh, just a constant. And these two basis functions, you can calculate using the flux, so the light curve of the star. And in particular, a delta RV rotation depends on the flux times the first time derivative of the flux. Uh, so here's the flux, for example, and then you've got, you can take the time derivative, and then you do FF prime. And so, for example, if you have a spot in the middle of your disk, uh, it's not going to have any effect on the rotational Doppler shift because it's in the middle, so it doesn't break the balance. So that's why it'd be zero here. Uh, and the uh, convective suppression of convective blue shifts goes as uh, the flux squared. So if we take this uh, activity model, we put it in a total model, so there they are, and then we add signals, Keplerian signals for the planets. So we find that the best model is with three Keplerian signals. And for planet B, uh, we, we know the periods of orbit and the time of first transit uh, from, the, um, from the transit data. So we don't model these. We just take these from Barris et al, who are uh, analyzing the transit data. And for planets C and D, because they don't transit, we model all the orbital parameters. So the amplitude, the eccentricity, time of periastron, and the period and uh, time of transit. And we add just a constant. Uh, so then we feed this model into a Monte Carlo Minecraft chain, and we look for the best solution. But when we do this, even the best solution, when we do uh, the data minus the model, so we get the residuals, we still get this uh, quasi-periodic signal. So there's the clear source of correlated noise. And uh, it's, well, we, we ideally, we want to find flat residuals. So there's clearly something left that we haven't taken into account. 
so one of the possible reasons for this would be that uh, the way we make our fits to the light curve, um, it, re it reacts quite slowly to the growth and decay of active regions. So uh, when you have uh, an active region which grow grows over less than one stellar rotation, uh, the model doesn't reflect that very well. So uh, there could be a problem with this. But it's most likely to be due to the fact that we're not accounting for all of the sources of uh, stellar activity uh, induced radial velocity variations. So in particular, I've mentioned faculty, they're sort of small bright spots uh, around st star spots in active regions, uh, which, um, could, which have a lot of magnetic flux going through them. So they're suppressing the convective blue shift and that could uh, have a significant effect. So we're not taking that into account yet. And also uh, there's recently uh, people have found on the sun that there are inflows of about up to 50 meters per second uh, around sun sunspots. So we also need to look at this. Uh, so to account for this n uh, noise, we've added an extra no uh, noise term uh, for the stellar rumble. So we add it in, uh, not in quadrature because it's, uh, it's not a random source of noise. It's a, it's a correlated systematic. So when we do this, uh, we get, so here's the data, and all of the y-axes are on the same uh, scale. So you can compare the amplitude of all your signals. So these are the activity signals, and you can see that they have a much greater amplitude. Uh, well, this one, so the suppression of convective blue shift has uh, variations of up to six meters per second. And if you look at the strongest signal, so Coro7C, that's about five meters per second. So uh, that's why we really, the activity is dominating the signal here, so we need to, that's why this is so important. Uh, here are the planets, so uh, Coro 7b, we find it has a mass of about three and a half Earth masses, and there's Coro 7c and Coro 7d, which are uh, sub-Neptune uh, mass planets. And you'll note here that we fixed the eccentricities to zero, uh, because uh, this is so when you want to fit for the eccentricity, you have to add two extra parameters per planet, and uh, it doesn't give, it doesn't make any difference. So it's better to just have fewer parameters and keep it zero. And in particular, so these are definitely even when we let the eccentricity vary, the eccentricity is negligible. But for Coro 7b, we find when we let it vary that it has an eccentricity of 0.22. Uh, so that's a three sigma detection. Uh, but then if we look at the mass that we get, this is with a circular model, and this is with an eccentric one. So uh, the masses agree within the error bars. The blue one comes up to about here. So um, it doesn't make a significant difference. So that's why we've stuck with the circular model, was especially that an eccentric planet in a one-day orbit uh, around its star would induce a lot of dynamical and energetic problems. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, we confirm the presence of Coro 7C and Coro 7D, uh, and they have periods of 3.6 and 8.5 days. And Coro 7B is likely to be a rocky planet. Uh, and uh, the, in the system, the activity induced radial velocity variations uh, are definitely dominant. Uh, and it will be very important to uh, find to try and improve this model. So uh, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, work on um, data from the sun to try and find uh, proxies that will allow us to improve the FF prime model that we're using uh, and then apply it to uh, Kepler candidates. And uh, we've got, so the Coro 7 team is going to uh, publish four papers. Uh, so Barris et al is for the uh, analysis of the light curve and then Hatsa et al are uh, analyzing the radial velocities with a different <coughs> method, and Lanza et al. Using, uh, they're using the light curve to uh, model the radial velocity variations, uh, so a bit similar to my work, but it, it with a different mod method. And uh, the good news is that this time, uh, it seems that we're actually agreeing on the number of planets and the masses. So, that's it.
thank you very much, Raphael, for not only a very interesting talk, but actually keeping on time, which is, I think, a first. <laughs> so, Anne-Marie. Um, I, thought, I saw that you mentioned that the contribution of the convection to the radial velocity is proportional to f to the square. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you justify it? How strong it, uh, an assumption is it? Uh, do you mean how it ends up being proportional to f square? Uh, so I don't know. I, I can't remember the details off the top of my head. But all the so the paper by Grantel, 2011. Uh, they go through all the derivations, so it depends on the radius of the star, the mass of the star, and they, they, it's a geometrical result in a way. So it just works out to be proportional to the square. Yes, over there. Yeah. You should have a transit time uh, duration, which is different when you have these other two planets, and you could observe it. If it's if it's uh, the mass is big enough and the, if the inclination is big enough, what are the inclinations you found for the two other planets? Uh, well, the thing is that the other two planets aren't transiting, so we can't tell, we can't measure their inclinations. Uh, but uh, Barras et al. who are analysing the transit uh, data, uh, they are not finding any TTVs, so. That is an indicator that, well, well, either they're too small to measure, or, well, it, it's not. It's an argument against the planet having Coro Seven B having a, an eccentric orbit. So, I hope I've answered your question. And uh, yes, down here, please. Um, this is really cool how you're using both the light curve and the radial velocities. Is it necessary to have them both to properly model the system? And if so, what implications does that have for uh, other follow-up of other planets? Uh, yes, so in 2009, when there was the initial uh, Coro run and the HAPS radial velocities, they weren't simultaneous. Uh, and... Uh, I think the paper by Kilo et al. Uh, tried to use a few Euler measurements, but they weren't quite good enough. And then the Coro 7, the Coro run was not simultaneous, so they couldn't get it to. It's because the, the, the activity changes so rapidly, we can't, we don't know enough about the proxies um, yeah. to model there. And so um, the Kepler candidates, uh, so. For example, Kepler 10b uh, is being observed by Harps North at the moment, and well, up to not very long ago, it was being observed simultaneously by Kepler and uh, Harps North. So we can apply that method. But hopefully, uh, in the future, we'll be able to find proxies like the, maybe a combination of the full width at half maximum of the spectral lines with something else, or to be able to not have to use the light curve at the same time. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more, let's thank Raphael again.